So I'm an idiot. <laughs> I am the biggest idiot on two legs, and uh, if you've been following my endeavors at any point in the last decade or so that I've been on YouTube, you know that this is not new information, what I'm telling you, but I really managed to outstupid myself in the last part. And you know what the most insulting thing about it is? It's that I actually did research for that episode. Like, I was looking through, like, Google and Wikipedia and all these, like, different sites about, you know... Uh, genes and traits and like you know genetics and scorpion DNA and all that the anatomy and all that shit so I had that stuff down cold and then I got in front of the camera I looked you all in the eye and I said snakes aren't animals <laughs> uh, I don't even have an excuse for that one that was just I was just a dumbass um, just goes to show you guys that you can be really smart in some areas and really fucking stupid in others. Um, so, yeah, I'm an idiot. I apologize for that. I, uh, I would say that a fuck-up of that magnitude will never happen again, but knowing me, that's an impossible promise. So, just, uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, now going into part four, usual message applies. I go over everything more or less in the order in which they occur. So something happened later on, I'll talk about it later on. And uh, we got some big things to talk about this time. So uh, let's get crazy, let's get nuts. So when you're following the creators of a show you're reviewing on Twitter and you see an exchange like this take place, I, for one, am left kind of baffled, because in a show where time and pacing have consistently been a major problem, where they now have the budget to hire professional voice actors and improve animation, or scale it back to a manageable fashion, however you prefer to look at it, and you have an animation staff so large that when you all moved out of stage 5, it cleared roughly 80% of the building, so clearly you have the manpower to get more work done. So when you say that that's not a feasible option, I'm left to ask, well, why the fuck not? Look, I get it. Animation is expensive, production schedules can be messy to handle, but Ruby's schedule has always seemed to operate on a level of chaos that I don't often hear about. Seriously, how many times have they bragged about getting an episode done at the last possible minute? The first time you do that is impressive. The twelfth time? Somebody should be fired by now. There's a good amount from my Volume 1 review that I'd back down from now, but the comments I made on pacing and time management are still relevant even now. They still can't manage to find that balance. The only volume that I've seen come close to getting that balance right is Volume 2, and I realize now that that's because nothing fucking happens in Volume 2. I'm just saying, pre-production isn't a polite suggestion. There's a reason it exists. Writing the show as you animate it is not a conducive way to get things done. Anyway, yeah, back to this kid. What are we having? I never agreed to these terms. It's part of the living under my roof contract. He's sleeping in a fucking barn, lady. So yeah, Ospin's consciousness is in this boy somehow, and yeah, the audience called that one from the beginning as well. But this whole bit just bothers me. Why did he possess this one random farm kid on a continent he doesn't even live on to go to Haven and do what exactly? What is he expecting is going to happen by sending this kid to Haven? What makes him think anyone is going to take this kid seriously? He's going to walk into Haven Academy and then they're going to laugh his ass all the way back to the farm. All this does is make Osman look like an asshole. There's still like 90% of a story missing here. This kid went from being freaked out to being annoyed that there's someone else living in his head with nothing in between that. Like, you're already having trouble managing four different stories, five counting the villains. Do we really need this kid on top of it? You can write this kid out and nothing changes. Move on. Oh god, no, I take it back. I'm not ready to see Weiss get beat up yet. You're not leaving Atlas. You're not to leave the manor grounds unless I specifically allow it. You are going to remain here, out of sight and out of trouble, until you and I come to an agreement on your future. Uh, yeah, no, you, you can't do that, because that's kind of sort of illegal. Yeah. Your presupposition that you can simply have whatever it is you want is a clear sign of our failure as parents. No, there are way more legitimate ways you have failed as parents. So want to know why the heiress to the Schnee Dust Company is suddenly nowhere to be found. Which is why you are no longer the heiress to the Schnee Dust Company. Dude, what is your deal? Like, who beat you as a child? 
You don't gain anything out of this. You should be glad she wants to be out of your hair because that means you don't have to worry about her anymore. You've essentially cut out any and all reasons to keep her there. You've all but disowned her pretty much and you're keeping her as a prisoner for what? You're wasting money keeping her fed and nourished when you have no reason whatsoever to keep her around and for what? To prove a point that you're the biggest piece of shit since Martin Shkreli? Literally the only reason you're doing this is to be an asshole. And as I established with Felix, being an asshole for the sake of being an asshole does not a compelling character make. I don't know how I feel about Schnee. On the one hand, I understand the psychology with abusive parents. Children are inherently wired to love their parents, and when that love gets used and abused, your brain gets torn between wanting to please the parents to earn their love and also understanding that what they're doing is not okay. The problem is we haven't really seen that. The few scenes we've gotten between these two are just him being a complete and utter cock and her just barely putting up with him. And Weiss's plotline was so badly butchered this season to fit in all the other storylines that what was always the most interesting part of her past got a completely half-assed portrayal here. The other problem stems from the fact that Jacques Schnee is a 40-year-old drama queen who at age 16 was probably throwing a shit fit because his parents got him a red Corolla instead of a black one. Ironwood doesn't take him seriously. Winter didn't sound like she took him all that seriously in Volume 3. Hell, even Weiss seems to regard him more with weariness up until this encounter. He does nothing to make friends with people, so who does he even really have on his side? This is the man who ruled the Schnee Dust Company with an iron fist and had the Faunus race squirming under his boot? He's a fucking joke. If Weiss wasn't bogged down with the emotional baggage, she could skewer him through the anus and roast him like a shish kebab. Fuck Schnee, he's a fucking man-child I'm tired of looking at him. Like, I don't remember the full story of Snow White that well, but I'm pretty sure the legend didn't involve her being locked in a castle. She just had a vain cunt of a stepmother who wanted her dead so that she could be the fairest in the land. There was nothing about a douche nozzle father or a bastard of a brother, and speaking of which... Which is why you've generously revoked your claim to the company and its earnings, passed them on to your brother Whitley. Oh hey look, Whitley turned out to be evil. Who didn't see that coming? I mean, aside from all the people who were arguing with me about it on Tumblr. No, I'm not kidding. People were actually openly fighting me on this, saying that he was merely acting in accordance to how he had been raised. Now, first of all, you don't get to use that argument on me, because I spent a good chunk of last volume pointing out that Winter was physically and emotionally abusive towards Weiss, and nobody fucking listened to me, so you can all go to hell. And second of all, Winter, I can at least accept that she's most likely just acting out how, how she'd been raised. Whitley? He's enjoying this. You can see it in his eyes, you can hear it in his voice, you can observe it in his mannerisms. He's a sadistic little shit. He revels in this. He probably gets off to it in his alone time. Like, Jacques may have set the standards, but Whitley was the one who went full on the rails with it. And if you really couldn't figure out by the very first conversation he had with Weiss that he was going to turn around and be an antagonist character for, well, and I don't know what the fuck to tell you except you need to consume more media, because this is one of the oldest cliches in the book. Yes, good idea, Weiss. Kill them. All of them. Okay, cutting back to Team Orange, Crow is getting them caught up to speed. So these... Maidens, they're powerful fighters that don't need dust to use magic. We know. And there are four of them? We know. Which means that whenever one of them dies, the power transfers to someone, a female, that they care about? Whoever was in their thoughts last, important distinction. We know! We fucking know! We heard it all already! Twice, in fact! Now, the questions you need to ask here are, did we need to have them repeat all this information a third time, and was there a less redundant way to write this exchange? The answers are no and yes in that order. The problem is that they're saying the information back to two entities, Crow and the audience, both of whom have been ahead of the main characters for ages. This scene only shows how painfully behind our own protagonists have been this entire time, that they're only just now getting caught up. The best way they could have done this was for one of them to say something along the lines of, so these maidens, that's what all this was about, and then some general questions about Pyrrha, and then call it a day. It doesn't matter that they're finding it out and specifying. We already know. We don't need the explanation again. I'm instantly reminded of Final Fantasy XIII, a game that barely explained anything to its audience, and the stuff that it did explain, it explained over and over and over and over again. This is basically the same deal. What is all of this? Ruby's being hunted. The schools are being attacked. All for what? What is the point of all of this? Will you just tell us what's going on? Actually, yeah, he raises a good point. So, in yet another example of suddenly introducing something majorly important with no build-up or prior knowledge save for a single solitary throwaway line, Crow introduces us to the story of the two brothers, which is probably the most cliché lore of gods ever told. 
It's literally a god of light and a god of darkness. Literally good versus evil, which by the way... There's no such thing as pure evil! Yeah, no, Blake, there is. There, there actually is. Oh, this doesn't make much sense because the whole purpose of the Grimm is to eradicate mankind, but the Grimm existed before mankind. So then what was the purpose of the Grimm before the brothers came to this agreement? But I mean, aside from this blatant lack of continuity, it's still something about the lore. I mean, it's an idea of gods in this world. <laughs> Not that bad. I mean, it's not like they really did something to completely fuck everything up. Well, that's the kicker. See, the four gifts to mankind aren't just metaphorical. Sorry, what? Each of them exists in a physical form, left behind by the gods before they abandon Remnant. Oh no, you're not. And each of them is extraordinarily powerful. You're really not. If someone were to collect all four, they'd be able to change the world. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. Oh my god, you are. The plot of Ruby, this is rich. The plot of Ruby, the main plot, the main focus, the driving force that has been behind the villain's entire motivation since literally the first fucking episode was to steal a MacGuffin. <laughs> and if you steal four of these MacGuffins, it allows you to make any wish you want come true. And so the plot is that our heroes have to save the four MacGuffins from falling into the wrong hands, or else Salem brings about the end of the world. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. I could chew my way through a fucking brick wall faster than these assholes can introduce the main plot of their series, and I'm the one working in healthcare. Okay, ignoring the fact that this is basically the plot to every Zelda game ever made ever, that the gods and creators of Remnant being the embodiments of light and darkness is about as vanilla as you can make it, and even ignoring the mind-boggling fact that Final Fantasy VIII actually did something better and the whole Warrior Academy's having a deeper purpose thing, this is the plot of the show. We are over three and a half years into this show and only just now do we know what it was all about, and it's completely out of left field. To recap, Volume 1 involved criminal activities and acts of terrorism and made us suspect the plan to divide the kingdoms and throw the world into open war so that the Grimm can kill everyone. Volume 2 more or less continued along with that idea. Volume 3 suddenly dropped a whole lot of bullshit mythical lore about maidens that the villains were trying to gain their powers. And now in Volume 4 we find out that all of this was about trying to find the fucking rainbow crystal so they can enact Doomsday on the world's populace. And they went three and a half volumes before deciding to finally inform the good audience of what was going on. The reveal for this kind of plot should have been at the end of volume one. There was no fucking reason they had to go four years before they dropped this. Could you imagine if Full Metal Alchemist pulled this shit? Imagine if the Elvick brothers just wandered for 40 episodes with vague intentions, unclear motivations, never once saying what journey they were on or why the younger brother is a six foot suit of armor. But no. Edward and Alphonse are searching for the Philosopher's Stone, a stone that will allow them to perform high-level alchemy without the rules of equivalent exchange. And the reason they want it is because they tried to bring their mother back from the dead and it ended up destroying their bodies in the process. This is all established within the first three episodes of the show, and everything that happens in the story is a direct result of their search. Slowly, bit by bit, their search reveals more of the plot going forward. Everything ties together. The plot twist makes sense. You understand why the villains are motivated to do what they do, why things are happening. In Ruby, there is none of that. Characters wander around aimlessly, motivations are vague, plot bombs come out of fucking nowhere, and don't make any sense in context with what we've learned in the past. Or, to use a more extreme example, Kingdom Hearts. The most convoluted, overly complicated series in the history of gaming somehow manages to at least tie everything together so that it still flows narratively. They reveal Xehanort's true plot, but it doesn't completely come out of nowhere because now Kingdom Hearts 1's storyline takes on a whole new meaning. Oh, it's stupid. It's one of the most ridiculous things you'll ever hear in your life, but at least the writer went out of his way to try and make sure everything tied together. There's a reason he spent the last decade working on backstory games. The fact of the matter is, when you actually sit down and manage to string together everything that's happened in the Kingdom Hearts games, you still get a functioning, flowing narrative. 
There's no flow to Ruby's writing. There is no connecting thread. There was no fucking build-up to Edison in the first three volumes. There was no indication that Osmond was hiding some world-ending artifacts in his office at any point in three seasons. Everything we hear is a blatant contradiction of things that were already established. This is not how you do reveals. It's not even how you add a plot later on. It's okay to come up with stuff later down a show's line, but you gotta make sure it ties in, that you can make connections to what was established at the beginning. When the writer of Kingdom Hearts is writing a more cohesive story than you are, stop writing immediately! Oh, and going back to the continuity thing I mentioned earlier, what happened to the whole man born from dust line? Because dust wasn't mentioned anywhere in Crow's story, nor were there any gods mentioned or any relics brought up in the opening narration of the show. There's no indication of any of that. Don't you think there should be something about this that should have some goddamn thing to do with the main plot you're pushing forward? But Tom, the opening narration was told by Salem, the villain. Doesn't that show a clear bias? Doesn't that mean that she would be an unreliable narrator and thus makes her word untrustworthy? That's worse! You're saying that the opening narration, the lines that brought us into the world, that set up everything we need to know about the world of Remnant going forward, was always complete and total bullshit. What you're saying is that the history we were provided in the opening, the world of Remnants, and the history of the Maidens as well as these gods and their relics are not to be trusted because who is giving that exposition? Well then why the fuck are we bothering with the world building bullshit if none of it is reliable? Like this isn't fucking Game of Thrones. At least in Game of Thrones, the history of Westeros, Robert's Rebellion, the founding of the Night's Watch, the history of the families, and the kingdoms are presented in clear black and white language, and then we get different interpretations and reactions from various sides as to the good or bad nature of them. We get the facts and we get the different reactions to add more depth to it. Here, by the aforementioned logic of the fans defending this, everything that is said to establish the lore has always been biased, unfounded bullshit. There's no core. There's no foundation. None of the shit we've been fed matters to anything. <laughs> Am I getting through to you people at all? Is any of this sinking in? You don't need to be Ernest fucking Hemingway to understand that there is a very clear lack of care being put into the series. Why isn't Atlas going after them or Mistral? And why aren't we in more of a hurry to get to Haven? Idiot, you're the one who's been wandering around the fucking continent for months. You tell me. She's trying to divide us, humanity. And so far, she's done a pretty damn good job. Is she? Is she really? Because I'm not exactly seeing lines drawn in the fucking sand here. But you know that crows are a sign of bad luck. And some people are just born unlucky. My semblance isn't like most. It's not exactly something I do. It's always there, whether I like it or not. I bring misfortune. What the fuck does that mean? I mean, yeah, the crow is seen as a symbol of bad luck, so maybe that's taken in a literal sense, like he literally turns into the symbol of bad luck. But how does... What fucking sense is that supposed to make? Why would a person's semblance be designed to work against them? Are there other people like this? Does someone have a semblance where dildos stick to them? Or a semblance that encourages dog to piss on them? Or where buildings spontaneously combust when they pass by? Do you think the suicide rate is high among individuals like these? Is that why Crow drinks so much? So what about Raven, because I'm guessing the other bird is her? Or is it more like a possession thing, like his semblance allows him to jump into a crow's body, but, but then would his body melt into the bird and... Oh god, why am I thinking so heavily on this? It, it's just... It's so stupid. It, it's some of the stupidest stuff I've ever heard. And, and, and think about how long I've been doing YouTube and all the stupid shit I've had to put up with over the years. Twilight, the Fisticuffs Army, a guy who literally fucked a car wash vacuum cleaner. And you know what? I can't even be angry at this, because I'm pretty sure somebody cut my cocaine with lighter fluid and none of this is actually real. But there's a dude who can turn into a bird because apparently he was born on Friday the 13th and his semblance came about as a result of that. I can't even make up shit like this on purpose. Well, you are just a real bundle of help, aren't you? Shut the fuck up, Jean! God damn it, I hate you! Meanwhile, back on Menagerie... I want to hear more about the adventures of Team Ruby. That's going to be a really short, really unimpressing story. Don't worry, I've got it. Sit down, sit down. I don't want to keep you if you're... Nonsense. I've been cooped up in here all day. You still take sugar, right? Oh, actually, uh... Oh, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Oh, here, take this one. No, really, it's no big deal. You sure? 
positive. Oh, good God, he is trying so hard to be a good parent. <laughs> Bless his heart. Seriously. It just seems like your outfit doesn't cover very much. Oh, okay, that, that might have been a bit much. Now, see, God damn it, this is what I mean. When they write a good moment, they write a really good moment. This is adorable. I teared up a bit. It's a sweet moment where Blake confronts her dad about some less than pleasant things she did in the past and how her parents love and forgive her no matter what. The whole thing about Blake possibly going down the dark path is admittedly false because in four seasons she never showed the slightest hint of going evil, but the rest is really pure, really adorable, and a good father-daughter bonding moment. This is when the writers really pull out their best stuff. And then they do shit like this. Son? Oh, whoa! This isn't the bathroom! Uh, I'll just be going! Sorry to interrupt this tender family- uh... No concept of privacy, no respect for personal space. Okay, people have been losing their fucking minds over this, about how Blake keeps slapping Son. Even Aaron had to come out and make some statement about it. And I get it. You know, violence is never the answer. It just begets more violence. You shouldn't hit people. It's not good. It's not a good lesson for, for people to learn. You should really use your words. You know, I, I get all that. It's, you know, it's abusive. It is abusive. I understand that. Believe me, I understand that. However, I would like to present this counter. Son followed her around for months without her knowledge, invited himself to her home against her wishes, made inappropriate comments in front of her parents, has generally been annoying from the minute he made his presence known, and now, the cherry on the shit Sunday, he's openly eavesdropping on an emotional confrontation with her own father on her past actions in her own fucking house. So you know what? No. I'm sorry, but I'm siding with Blake on this one. Violence may not be a good answer, but sometimes you just gotta smack a motherfucker. And if I was Blake and someone was doing this shit to me, I'd pimp slap that son of a bitch into another species of animal. And he's about to prove the extent of his uselessness in five, four, three, two, one. Your mom said White Fang members don't wear masks in Menagerie, but I saw one at the market yesterday. I even got a picture. You mean to tell me you saw a White Fang mask walking around that crowd before you got to Blake's house and before you even knew the White Fang were in Menagerie and only just now occurred to you to let her know about this, you fucking waste of evolutionary genetics? I'm starting to think not having Sun be in the majority of Volume 3 ended up hurting him. Because the writers seem to have forgotten that there was a character there that they were supposed to be writing. Because yeah, Sun was always bumbling and foolish, but at least before he had his heart in the right place. Like, you could tell he was doing things with good intentions and was genuinely trying to be help. Even if he didn't always succeed in doing so. In this volume, Sun exists purely to get in the way. He has reached Jean Arc levels of annoyance that I didn't think was possible of anyone other than Jean. Why is he even here? Look, I get it, Michael's your best voice actor, but that's really no excuse to have to put up with this shit. A freaking ninja? A spy. Spying on what? There hasn't exactly been any earth-shattering conversations going on the White Fang need to concern themselves with. Or does Blake's family soap opera drummer make for really good conversation at the White Fang meetings? Well, that's unfortunate. Now, contrary to media belief, scorpion venom isn't all that deadly. Of 1,500 species of scorpion, roughly 25 of them actually have venom that is lethal to humans, and even among that, the majority of them will not kill a healthy human being. And we have to assume that aside from his liver being practically non-existent, given how he took on Tyrion, he's got to be in pretty good shape. Also, I'm pretty sure it doesn't turn your blood purple, but that I admittedly haven't looked up. Alright, I'm gonna stop here. I'm sure my neighbor upstairs thinks I'm a raging fucking psychopath, but you know what? Sometimes you see and hear things that make you want to slam your head in the door frame. So, I'm gonna go. Hope you enjoyed it. See you in part five. I'm gonna go try and do something with my life. Yeah, I'll see you guys next time. So, somebody remembered to go back and get that map, right?